when I go on vacation where there's no job, there's, there's nothing to do, there's nobody else to take care of. What's amazing to me, and, and this is sobering as I think about potentially moving into my post-economic phase, but it catches me um, that from the time I get up in the morning until the time I go to sleep at night, I can be busy. I can be busy just taking care of me. Just maintaining myself. I mean, can you imagine that? The, the various, you know, various feedings that uh, have to happen. Entertainment, uh, maybe a little exercise. Just by virtue of having a, a body, there's so much to do. You have to uh, feed these things. You have to give them some sleep. You have to, it's generally acceptable to keep them clothed. Um, you've got to drive them around, keep them warm or cool them off depending on the situation. You've got to find some shelter for them. This is a full-time job. Some of you may have experienced that, but it surprises me that I'm able to spend a whole day and on vacation a whole week just taking care of me. Tonight we are going to talk about just one thing and the subject is service. When we use the image of service we immediately think of stuff to do, right? Think about doing good stuff, you know, for people or the planet or something. As you might guess we're gonna have a little twist on things. We want to talk about authentic service. We want to talk about transparent service. We want to talk about a service that is not doing. For me, one of the, the great models of, of transparent service in our time uh, has really been Mother Teresa. What a privilege to have had her on the planet during our lifetimes. She said some things that for me begin to illuminate the subject that there are no great things to do. There are only small things to do that we can do with great love. She's also the one that has taught us that we, we overcome the finite with the infinite. Mother Teresa would again and again communicate to the, the sisters of her community, we are not social workers. We are contemplatives in the heart of the world. 24 hours a day with the one presence. We are not social workers. We are contemplatives in the heart of the world, 24 hours a day with the one presence. For me, that begins to, to get a hold of what it is that we're pointing at when we're pointing at transparent service, service that uh, points to something else. It's not just doing, it's not just being caught in the frenzy of activity, whatever social redeeming uh, value that activity may have, but it's transparent to something else, to something deeper. As you and I think about being teachers, doctors, healthcare workers, therapists, maintenance folks, retired people, scientists, accountants, whatever, what is it that we are being transparent to uh, in the doing of our doing? Uh, another great voice for me has been that of uh, Dag Hammarskjöld. Dag Hammarskjöld was the Secretary General of the United Nations from 1952 until 1961 when he died in an airplane crash in Rhodesia while doing what he did. Uh, trying to negotiate some kind of uh, peace settlement. People began to understand the depth out of which this man operated. And he understood a lot about authentic service. And part of his message was that we can only receive and share and transmit and possess 
and focus the light as we are like a lens. The extent to which we focus upon ourselves, we rob the lens of its capability of being transparent, of doing its work. And furthermore, he equated transparency with fullness in life. To live life fully, to experience the fullness of life, one has to be transparent. And to be transparent, one has to give up life as oneself as an end and become purely a means. When people talk about being in the here and the now and being present, we're really talking about the sensual presence. Most of us are pretty good, right, at being present at a party, at um, a nice dinner, nice sunset, when we're interact, sharing a drink with friends, uh, out on the golf course, we're pretty good at being present in those situations, right? Yeah, that's sort of what I talk about as the sensual presence. But what does it mean to be present to the radical now, the radical present, the fiery furnace of being? And you don't have to go anywhere to encounter the fiery furnace of being. It is already right here. You don't have to leave your seat. You don't even have to wait another minute. It's always there always available, always present. And the thing about the fiery furnace is that when you and I begin to awaken to this fiery furnace, some things happen. The first is we get burnt. Uh, I get burnt. In fact, the great literature is very clear about any human being who gazes into the face of being it will die. Sort of like that. So when you and I begin to be present to the fiery furnace of being, we have to be prepared to um, have our eyelids singed, our uh, eyebrows uh, singed. But we have to be prepared for also being transformed. Uh, transformed into the likeness of that into which we are peering. Uh, Joe Matthews, one of the great depth teachers of the 20th century, said that when you and I make the journey to the center of being, however that shows up, that what happens is then we get sent back. We get sent back. And we get sent back to serve. We get sent back to be the lens, the transmitter of light back into the time and space world in which we dwell. Thomas Merton, a pioneering uh, contemplative in the, the 20th century, in his 462-page uh, autobiography, on the last page, he sort of rehearses all of the adventures and journeys and and experiences and travels and the roles as um, as a poet and an artist and a writer and a lover and a seeker after truth and and mostly all of the doors that have been shut and been shut and been shut and been shut in his life and all the things that have been withdrawn and taken away until he finds his way into uh, a Trappist monastery and uh, becomes a monk. And, uh, and then his, the last image of, of his autobiography points to the reality of living in the radical present. He talks about the ultimate reality of burnt men of burnt men. Ironically, or maybe not, Merton was at a retreat in Thailand and got out of the shower and had some wet feet and grabbed a hold of a faulty electric fan and was electrocuted. He became the burnt man of his poetry. One of my great teachers about service and about 
presence was our son Zachary. Zachary, after his second stem cell transplant, and most oncologists will tell you that there's probably nothing more uh, potentially gruesome and horrific that you can do to the uh, human body than a stem cell transplant if it doesn't do exactly what it's supposed to do and statistically very few of them do. And uh, my wife had been in an encounter with Zachary and this was after, in the aftermath of the second stem cell. He, at that point, hadn't, hadn't eaten anything for well over a month or, or, or had anything to drink, not even a sip of water. Everything had been done intravenously and his digestive tract essentially had been burned out uh, by, as a re reaction to the stem cell transplant. And, and his body was covered by uh, about a thousand uh, small blisters that, from the radiation that had been used to destroy his immune system so that it would not reject. And, and it was quite a journey just to walk into his room and encounter him. Anne was uh, in one such encounter and, and she uh, had to leave the room to have a little personal breakdown and, and, and the breakdown was not over the appearance of Zachary, which could have done that, or over the pain he was in, which could have done it, or the incredible helplessness to do anything to affect an outcome with this. But her breakdown came over the, and she had to leave the room because of something he said. And, and what he said was, out of this experience, I, uh, I want to learn compassion and I want to help people, that that's what he wanted to do. That he had been to the, the center of being. Uh, he had experienced uh, the ultimate encounter and come back, been sent back. And he knew what he had to do. He had become uh, a burnt man. Zachary continues to be my great teacher. Any great service that is not informed by the contemplative depth is just doing. It's just more of the, the frenzy of the rat race. Unless we are transparent, unless the light comes through, our doing is just doing. What if the ultimate orchestrator uh, needed the presence, a loving presence, on your block, the block where you live, what if the ultimate orchestrator uh, needed uh, a certain vibration, a certain presence, just like you in the office where you go every day, or in the classroom where you go every day, or in the family where you live? If we want to uh, alleviate human suffering, we generally don't need to look very far. Oftentimes, we don't have to look outside our community, uh, outside our neighborhood, outside of our own house or our own family. And this transparency is precisely the call to all of us to begin to be a lens, to begin to channel the light where it's needed and when it's needed and where we are right here and right now. I would invite us all to consider the invitation to participate in the great work. The great work is taking the, the journey that we've shared these last 10 months and taking the, the depth and the awareness and the transparency and beginning to, to find the ways to channel that light in the great work wherever you and I show up, doing whatever we're doing in all of our relationships, in all of our encounters, in all of our experiences. And as we find a way uh, to do that, that's how it is that the world gets transformed and it doesn't get transformed any other way. And we finally get delivered to the awareness that there is nothing to do I surrender to the light. I overcome the finite with the infinite. The great work is being done through me. 
There's nothing to do. I surrender to the light. I overcome the finite with the infinite. The great work is being done through me. There is nothing to do. I surrender to the light. I overcome the finite with the infinite. The great work is being done through me.